How you guys doing? Everybody doing okay? Um, online, we love you guys, and we are so glad that you are here with us today, and um, especially, our, we're just mindful of all the folks that are here tuning in every single week and faithful to church, and we know that God's got a blessing for you guys today as well. So we are starting a brand new series today, and it's all about the miracles of Jesus Christ. Uh, miracles are a fun topic, Amen. Miracles are a fun topic. So it's called Lord Overall because when Jesus did miracles, he would come in and he would show his lordship, his power, his dominance, if you will, over different aspects of the world and nature just to show that he was the one true God. So Isaiah 61 verse 1 said it like this. It said, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me. And this is talking about the coming Messiah. This is in the Old Testament. This is a prophecy. It says, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. And then Isaiah 35 5 says it like this. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf Deaf, unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer, and the mute tongue shall shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness. Do you see the abundance there and the generosity there? And streams in the desert. The deaf will hear, the dumb will talk, the blind will see, the lame will walk. Amen? It's one of the greatest things you love about Jesus. If you know him today, you love that he has that, that incredible combination of both the power of God, he can do anything, and the love of God, he loves you enough to do anything. He can and he will, amen? And Jesus shows us when he walked his earthly life that God can and God will. Because when he faced people and he faced people in need, Jesus did something. And you're going to see that today as we look at the miracles. Jesus did something. We love it. One of, the, one of the early things that Peter said about Jesus, and this is in Acts chapter 2, verse 22. Peter's talking. He's preaching a sermon. He says, people of Israel, listen. God publicly endorsed Jesus the Nazarene by doing powerful miracles, wonders, and signs through him, as you well know. It's meant to build your faith. The early apostles, as they were preaching the gospel and planting the early church, first century, they were telling people about the miracles of Jesus because they were well known and they proved that he was the one true God. Amen? And so for this series, we're going to look at one miracle per week. And we're going to show what Jesus was over in that particular miracle. And not only that, but this is the fun part is we're going to look at all the different unique aspects of Jesus' personality that come out in the midst of that story. Because as you read the Gospels, here's one of the wonderful things, is as you read the Gospels, you get to know Jesus. And some of you guys are old Christians. Some of you guys have been around a while, and it's been a while since you read about Jesus and reintroduced yourself to him. What we're looking for here more than anything else is a fresh love for the Savior. Amen? Do you want that today? Do you want a fresh love for your Savior today? Because that's what this is going to be all about. Now, before we get to the actual miracle today, I want to talk to you about miracles in general for a second. And I want to go after a little bit of a brainy question for you, Second Service. Um, this brainy question is this. Um, sometimes people might come up to you and say, I don't believe in miracles. Instead, I believe in science. And what I would say to them is, I do too believe in science absolutely believe in science, but I believe that science describes to us nature and that nature is a series of processes and engines, I would say, that have been created by God himself. I believe in science and I believe that miracles are God stepping on the stage of his own play as if Shakespeare himself stood on his own stage and decided to be an actor in his play. That is when Jesus comes to town and Jesus decides to take the creative, universe-maintaining, creating power of God and he brings it onto the stage is what Jesus does. When I used to be in technology, um, I was a computer designer or, or a systems programmer and what we would do is we would come to business problems and we would write software to solve a business problem. 
And so there was a pizza company, that, I, and I won't name them, but there was a pizza company. And they had a call center. And whenever you had a problem with your pizza, you called into the call center. And I wrote the software that helped them answer those calls. And so somebody's pizza was late. We, we let them put that in there. And then a process was written that said, send an email to the store manager. And we would handle all kinds of different problems, hundreds of different problems that would come into that. Even if somebody found something that was not supposed to be in their pizza, like something organic and wrong and, and, and there were things and we had a list of things that could have been found in their pizza and, and I know this is gross but it's not lunchtime yet so and it would, it would notify a lawyer that we had a real problem here now I wasn't a lawyer but I wrote the process that notified the lawyer now once I stepped back from the process that I had written that process continued to work without me amen that software continued to serve a whole lot of people without me. God does this in nature. God writes so many different processes. And he builds structures and systems and rules. And you have things like gravitational forces. And you have the seasons. And you have the, 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 the orientation of the earth according to the sun. And it goes on and on and on. And it's, it's thousands and millions of different things that bring you to this place that you are at today. But the creator made those things. And we're so used to those things. And sometimes when we feel like we can observe those things and describe those things that God has made. And we feel like we have power over it because we can understand it, because we can write it down. That doesn't mean we have power over it. And just because there's a percentage of it that we think that we understand in nature does not mean that we understand all of it. So an illustration for you, all those processes, everything in nature is, is like God putting on a glove. And everything that you see every single day around you these are the systems that he's created. This is nature. And again, you're, you're used to interacting with this and seeing this and understanding this, but you forget the hand that's inside, amen? We often forget the hand that's inside. So the miracle that we're talking about, spoiler alert right now, we're going to talk about turning the water into wine. That's our miracle today. Do you know that God created a process and he created an engine? It's called a grape and what does that little grape do? The little grape, it, it takes rainwater out of the ground, and it takes soil and nutrients, and it takes sunlight. You know, photosynthesis, right? You learned this in school. And it turns rainwater into grape juice, does it not? And that little engine does that without fail because God designed and built that engine. And there's a moment that's going to happen where Jesus is going to look at water and he's going to take the glove off the hand and he's going to touch the water directly with the hand of Almighty God. And he's going to do what he has always done. He's going to do directly to that water. He's going to change it instantly to wine. And he's going to do what he has always done and left to natural process. But like Shakespeare standing on his own stage, Jesus will be an actor in his own world and he will make it happen. Does that make sense to you? I don't believe in science. I, I don't believe in miracles. I believe in science. No, I believe in both. And Jesus is the creator of science. Are you with me today? All right, all right, let's get into John 2 then. John 2 is where we're going to go. And if you're online, go ahead and pull out your Bibles, maybe hit pause and uh, get, get a Bible out, and we're going to be in John 2. This is a wedding. This is a wedding in a town called Cana, and we need to talk about weddings for just a moment here so that you can understand the kind of context in which this is happening. Weddings are a wonderful day, amen? Yeah. Are weddings a fun time? Everybody dresses up and there's music and, and the bride looks beautiful and everybody enjoys the wedding unless the pastor makes a mistake, which has never happened to me, ever. 
So I just share a couple with you. Um, there was one time when we were at the, like this botanical gardens and we were doing this wedding. And um, I remember the bride so much wanted this thing to be outside, but it was calling for rain. And we really should have been moved inside. And we really kind of let her to all, talk us all into staying outside, which is never a good idea, but we did anyway. And I preach on an iPad and literally it's sprinkling on my iPad screen while I'm doing the vows. And I'm starting to rush things and starting to talk really, really fast. So we don't get rained on. We didn't get rained on, thank God. That was one day. One day we, we, we had a wedding and it was out at a, a, an orchard and it was beautiful. And, and most of my bad stories are from outdoor weddings, by the way. Um, and we were out this orchard and it was so crazy windy. And we had microphones so that people could hear us, but you couldn't hear anything we said because it was so windy into the microphone. And um, I remember uh, uh, la or last week, yeah, I talked about last week, uh, I was at a wedding there. And uh, just the way that it hit us, the sun hit us so, so hard and it was so hot that I was sweating so bad in my suit, water's dripping off my face while I'm preaching to the bride and groom. And that was very special and a great memory. <laughs> the worst, though, the worst was um, I forgot the groom's name. It only happened once. And I remember um, it was somebody in the church, and I didn't know the couple and they're like, I've got this family member and they really need a pastor. It's very last minute. And, and I know you don't know them. They don't go to our church, but would you please, please, please? And I said, okay, and, and did the thing. And, and this is one of the reasons I don't do that anymore. But I did the thing and um, I didn't know the bride and groom and showed up that day and I'm getting to know them and stuff. But it's like, I just did this thing right in the middle of the ceremony. And I switched that young man's name out for another name. And um, his grandma was sitting right there and she was just, she's dressed to the nines, you know, and she's just really mad at me. And yells out, his name is mm, this. I still don't remember what his name was, but she told me, she told me. The better thing from the wedding, though, is receptions, right? The reception is the great part. The reception is the part when everything that's tense, everything that's hard to do, it's all done. And everybody gets to go party. And there's food and there's music and it's a great time at the reception. And when you're a pastor, this is one of the good things about your job is that you get to go to a lot of receptions here. And sometimes I would take the kids with me and there was this one particular wedding reception and they had dancing and Gracie loves to dance. And I'm just going to put her on the spot just a little bit. But this is me and her dancing and doesn't she look insanely cute right there. Um, but when little girl asked dad to go and dance, dad is not going to say no. Amen, dads, you're not going to say no to that. And we had a great time. And this same exact wedding, um, this was a very, very German family. So not only did they have dancing, but one of the things they had outside was a log sawing contest, no lie. And so you can't see my face because of the interpreter there, but that's Gracie still. And she, of course, wanted to go right for it. And do you see the guy in the German hat like with the timer? Because they're timing you how long you take. And they took the whole thing very literal. It was, it was prizes and everything. We did not win that night, but they were all very impressed at how serious Gracie was about the entire thing. And we beat several of the grown male teams. I'll just say that to her credit. She was on it. She was on it. John chapter 2. We're at a wedding, and I needed to share some of that stuff because we, we need to get there. You need to remember, because sometimes we're just reading our Bible, right? And everything's like, oh, you know, this is in Nazareth, whatever, Sunday school. It's like, no, you're at a wedding right now, and there's music, and people are happy, and they're having a good time. And it's going to tell us here in a second that Jesus was invited. The next day, verse 1, there was a wedding celebration in the village of Cana in Galilee. And Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the celebration. Now, that's the reception is where we're at. We're at the party. And the wine supply, verse 3, ran out during the festivities. And so Jesus' mother told him they have no more wine. Now let's look at the characters really quick. So Jesus is there, and his mom is there. He's a grown man. He's there with his disciples, essentially like his co-workers in this picture. And his mom is also there. How much tension is in the room already? Right? Like plenty. 
but it's probably a family friend whose wedding this is. That's why he and Mary had both been invited to this. So it's kind of an extension of their family, and they're there, and everything's going great, except they run out of wine. Now, this is a really big deal in ancient times. So our modern receptions are like two hours, and you're out. But in ancient times, in the Jewish tradition, these things would go on for days, and you needed to have supplies, and they ran out of wine. And what does that tell you? It tells you that you've got a young, foolish bride and groom, amen, that don't know how to plan a big event. <laughs> and a lot of times that's the case. We t we, don't we do this in our culture? I don't know why we do this. We take young man, we take young woman, and we make them throw the biggest party of their entire lives, and then we're all shocked that it's not highly organized. I don't... <laughs> I don't know why we do that. So anyway, this would have been a really big deal. Verse 4, um, so Mary had told Jesus they have no more wine. Jesus says, verse 4, dear woman, that's not our problem. Yep, some of you are getting it. My time has not yet come. Now, when, when mama says there's no more wine, What's she actually saying? <laughs> Fix it. That's actually what she's saying. It's not, there's a lot that's not in the text today that we're going to have to read into this little interaction, but that's the first thing. When your mother comes to you and says, this is a thing, she doesn't, she's not giving you an FYI. <laughs> she wants it fixed. And Jesus says, dear woman, that's not our problem. And some of you went like, oh, and you should have. You should have. Even the word dear there, it's like I had to look this up. Um, he's, he's actually not being super respectful and nice in this moment. Um, there's a little bit of a language breakdown, but in the New Living Translation, the NIV, they put the word dear in here, I think just because the translators were worried about this moment, and they were trying to soften it, but it's not in the original. He just calls her woman. So do what you want with that. He <laughs> says woman. It's a bad start. And then he says, my hour has not yet come. Now, what's that mean? So she said, they're out of wine. The implication is fix this, Jesus. First off, Mary, why don't you just drive to Walmart or something like that and get some more wine? Now, she goes to her son. Again, this is common. I want you to fix this. And he says, my hour has not yet come. Now, there's five times this phrase shows up in the Gospels. My hour has not yet come. Jesus uses this phrase to mean, his, when he says his hour or his time, he means the time when he is going to die and be resurrected. When his power will be fully known in this world. He'll be fully revealed in this world. And his response to her, she's, he, he reads her request as, Jesus, work a miracle right now. He has not publicly worked any miracles yet. This is the very first one is in his entire public ministry. The end of chapter 2 is going to give us that little detail, that this is the first time Jesus went public and revealed himself. So he looks at her and he says, I don't know, my hour has not yet come yet. I'm not ready to die. Doesn't that sound a little bit extreme, Jesus? I mean you're not ready to die. And there's a lot of possible interpretations here. But Mary's nudging him, right? Mary knows who her son is. Mary, go back to Christmas, she heard the angel, did she not? She knows what the angel said about her boy. She saw the wise men show up and bow down to her toddler. They got down on their knees to her toddler and they gave him expensive gifts. Do you remember what they were? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh? Mary has, grown, Mary has watched him grow up all this time, knowing exactly who he is. We don't know. It's not told to us if he did any miracles up to this point privately. We don't know that. But she thinks it's time. And she thinks it's time, and she thinks it solves a problem in the midst of this, and she's nudging her son, and there's some tension there, and I kind of imagine the disciples sitting there looking at mom, looking at dad, and going like, this is really tense. When is this going to get solved? You know what I mean? It's just, they're going to feel that in the room. So many possibilities, and you read the commentaries on this, and they're kind of all over the map as far as what the interaction was that actually took place here. 
Jesus may have felt that in order to accomplish this miracle, that he was going to have to go a little bit too public with it. And it may be that in the moment, he finds a way to do it a little bit more privately, and you're going to see that here in just a second. But his concerns were not unfounded. One of the things, if you study the Gospels, you see Jesus over and over again is very much monitoring his public image because some of the miracles that he does, if he does them too quick or too publicly, they might have consequences. So there's a lot of times that somebody will need somebody like healed of their sickness and Jesus will say, let's go into this room and shut the door and then I'll heal them. Or he'll heal somebody else of blindness and he'll say, now don't tell anybody else that I did this for you. Do you remember those moments? And he does that a lot. And he's constantly trying to manage how many people know what it is he's really capable of. And, and, and I'll, I'll point you at two other, other moments in the future of his ministry. When Jesus feeds the 5,000, it makes such waves that it says the people after he had fed them come and they expect Jesus to become king. They even try to force him to become king because they get way too excited. When Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, it says right after that that the religious leaders started their plot officially to kill Jesus. Not only did they want to kill Jesus because he had raised somebody from the dead, they also wanted to kill Lazarus because he was the evidence of the miracle. So Jesus saying, listen, I've got some things to accomplish. I've got some parables to preach. Okay, I've got some disciples to train up. Like I've got some work to do here on my mission before I get to that cross, mama. Don't rush me. That's my interpretation. <laughs> then a very tense verse 5. But his mother told the servants, do whatever he tells you. She doesn't even answer him. I can't. You can't make this stuff up. It's just so good. She just, she takes that. She looks at the, she didn't even talk to Jesus anymore. She just looks at the servants and says, do whatever he tells you. Assuming he's going to tell you something. Because I'm leaving. I'm going to go talk to somebody, right? She's getting out of here. Do whatever he tells you to the servants. You could summarize this entire text right there with that verse and change your entire life. Do whatever Jesus tells you to do. How would our lives be different? Do whatever he tells you to do. And then the servants... They've got some stuff to do. Standing nearby were six stone water jars used for Jewish ceremonial washing, and each could hold 20 to 30 gallons. Now, I struggled with the math during first service on this. Six gallons times 20 is how much? 120 gallons, or it could have been 30 gallons, 20 to 30-ish. Could have been as much as 180 gallons. Jesus is about to turn 180 gallons of water into 180 gallons of wine. Did I get the math right that time? I think I did. So standing there were six stone jars, and Jesus told the ser servants, fill the jars with water. And when the jars had been filled, he said, now dip some out and take it to the master of ceremonies. And so the servants followed his instructions. They've got an MC at this wedding. They've hired a wedding coordinator, somebody who's in charge. And he just looks at them and says, take that water and I want you to dip some out and take it to the MC. Now, you might wonder, where did the miracle happen? We're not told. We're not told how it happened. But think for a second, 180 gallons of water. They did not have indoor plumbing at this time. That means the servants, they went to the well with buckets and they brought 180 gallons of water back. This was work. This was effort. This was time. They were sweating when this was done. Now, what do the servants know? The servants know we're out of wine. He says, go fill up these things with water. Are you mad as a servant right now? <laughs> Are you a little annoyed at this? Because you didn't go to Sunday school. You didn't read about water into wine. This hadn't even happened yet. So they don't know anything about this. We're just filling up water? Okay. They don't know who this guy is. They don't know God himself just happened to be invited to the party today. They don't know any of those things. You got to see it through your lens to understand the drama of this moment. But they are obediently filling these things up so that Jesus can use them. 
And does he do some special like, you know, maneuver over top of the jars and they become wine? I mean, I don't know. I kind of want it to be that, but I don't know. We're not given the moment. It just happens. It just becomes wine. But here's another little thing for you. Sometimes God starts with what you have and then he gives you what you need. He starts with your water and he makes it wine. And some of us came today and you need God to do something amazing in your life and he wants to start with what you have. Next, verse nine. When the master of ceremonies tasted the water that was now wine, not knowing where it had come from, though of course the servants knew, he called the bridegroom over. A host always serves the best wine first, he said. Then when everyone has had a lot to drink, he brings out the less expensive wine. But you have kept the best till now. And this miraculous sign at Canaan and Galilee was the first time Jesus revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. You bet they believed in him. You bet they did. What do you see in this? Not only the power of God, but look at the generosity of God. 180 gallons of wine Do you think he could have done that with less? I think he could have. He could have made his point with less. But also, this is fermented alcohol. I'm going to give you a minute on that. (laughs) Fermentation is not a word that's used in this text. But look at what the NC says. He says, you brought us out great tasting wine. That's awesome. So Jesus doesn't just make wine. He makes the best wine. Amen? He makes the best. But he says there's a principle at weddings. You start with the fancy bottled wine stuff that's expensive per bottle. And then once people have had a lot to drink, because their senses get not so good over time, fermentation, right? Then you bring out the box stuff later on. Like, that's the order you do this in. The MC is assuming actual alcohol in this passage. I just need to make this clear. Because sometimes, depending on the background that you've come from in your churches, some of your denominational backgrounds were okay with alcohol and some of them weren't. This is Jesus' very first public miracle, and he makes 180 gallons of fermented wine. And he keeps a party going. I don't know how you get around that. (laughs) So face it. Face it. God is not against alcohol. He's not against joy. He's not against parties. Is he against inappropriate, destructive social drinking? Yes. But it doesn't mean that he's against this. So let me give you three scriptures just to prove my point because this is also going to bring balance to this because I'm not just going to leave that out there. I'm going to give you some balance here. So first off, when it comes to alcohol, I've actually got an alcohol slide for you. I never thought I'd make one, but there it is. <laughs> so we interpret scripture with scripture, right? We don't just take one story or one teaching in the Bible in isolation. We look at what the whole of scripture says, and that helps us understand the full heart of God. So here's how we do this. First off, you see Jesus creating 180 gallons of of good, high-quality fermented wine. But when you go to Ephesians 5.18, it says, don't get drunk. So there's some balance. If you read that, that, that full verse, what it says is don't become drunk with wine, but instead be filled or be controlled by the Holy Spirit. Because we always have a choice of what we're controlled by. And sometimes when we go with too far with alcohol or other substances, I don't think this is just about alcohol. You go too far with other substances, you get to a point where you're no longer making wise decisions. Amen? And so don't get drunk. Don't put yourself in a place where you're no longer in control. Instead, give control to God. So that's some balance. The next one is, is your drinking bringing pain or sin into your life? And if so, cut it off. So there's a spot where Jesus says, listen, if your right hand, uh, uh, right hand, right hand. (laughs) It's been a day, it really has. Um, If your right hand, which is a good thing, if it's bringing destruction into your life, Cut it off. 
If your eye is bringing destruction into your life, pluck it out. Very violent, picturesque words, right? Jesus is giving us there. But you see his point is there's a lot of things as a Christian that I have the freedom to do and to have in my life. But he's like, listen, if you're somebody who has the freedom of drinking alcohol, yet you're becoming an alcoholic and you've got no place being in bars because you're going to binge again, then maybe you just need to cut the thing off. Wisdom, right? Next, last, will you let love limit you? So Romans 14 is a great passage. I highly recommend it. But it talks about all kinds of things that are um, uh, things that we have in the Christian life. They're not necessarily rules or, or, or commands in the scripture, but they are my convictions. So there are things that you feel like God has told you to do, a guideline that you've brought into your life from God, and you might not even have a verse on it. And what he says is there's some people, he, he, he's the example in Romans, he says some people won't eat meat, and that's their conviction. And he just tries to clean it up in that passage. He says, you shouldn't judge you. Christian A should not judge Christian B for eating meat or not eating meat or any of it. It's your conviction. Why don't you love each other and leave each other alone? (laughs) My own version, have to summarize that. You could use the same thing with alcohol. There are people that come into our life groups, come into our churches sometimes, and they've got a very destructive history of alcoholism in their family. And there's baggage there. And if they come to your life group, your next life group cookout, and there's alcohol being drunk at your life group cookout, that may be an issue for them. And all it says is love those people. Choose to limit your freedom for love. Love is more important than your blessing. Ooh, amen? Amen. Okay. Next, just some things I notice about Jesus, and I just love in this passage, his personality. Again, you want to fall in love with him. Look at these little details. I think they're so good. I love that he respects his mom. And you're like, well, he calls her woman. I know, but he does what she told him. Right? His mom says, hey, I need to interrupt your, your, your big ministry plan, Jesus, and I need you to take care of this family issue right here. And he responds, does he not? That's respect, that's honor for parents. And I love that even Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is that way. The other thing is, he cares about little things. Some of us, it's like we can go to God about cancer, but we won't go to God about car trouble. We'll go about the big things, but we won't go about the little things. And Jesus is Lord over the little things. And he wants to get involved. Of all the things that he could have done for his very first miracle, the Lord of glory. And he fixes a problem at a wedding. Tiny little problem. What is that to me is what he should have said and he should have walked away. This is not how we were going to do the rollout. (laughs) That's what he should have said. But he cares about a little bride and groom who are stuck. And he loves them. And not only does he care for them, but he doesn't steal their attention. Do you notice that? It's amazing to me. Just even that little detail just shows something just real precious about Jesus' heart. You know, when when I do a a rehearsal for a wedding, and I've got the the, the groomsmen here, and i got the bridesmaids here, and we're talking about how the wedding's going to be. I give them some rules, okay? I give them some things they got to do. One of the number one rules is you follow the bride everywhere she goes. Like if you're standing here and the bride's walking down, your body faces her the entire time, right? And if she goes back for like a, a, I don't know, unity candle ceremony or something like that, if you're a bridesmaid, you're going to turn and you're going to face her. Why? Because everyone should adore the bride because she is beautiful and this is her day and it's the way that you bless her is to show her that attention, And Jesus is in the middle of this reception and he's fixing this problem and he had every right to take all the attention away from the bride and groom and say, didn't I just save the day? And he doesn't. Only the servants and the disciples and Mary knew what he had done and he just hangs in the background. I don't know, I think that's cool. And he makes really good wine. I don't know if you noticed that. I love that. 
I love that. <laughs> I'm not going to read this to you today, but just even in my study, it's like there are all these Old Testament um, prophecies about heaven and about what the Messiah is going to bring to us, and they describe wine flowing. And they describe how the person who's actually stomping out the grapes to make wine, they say he's overrun by the person that's planting the, the, the next round of grapes, how, how the seasons start to get mixed up because there's so much abundance, you just can't get the harvest done. That's the way it's going to be in heaven. And it said that, 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 that fresh, good wine is going to pour down from the hills. That's what heaven's going to be like. The marriage supper of the lamb, it's going to be a party. And we see Jesus revealed as the Lord, the party. And some of you have been told, some of you have been taught, God's boring. And some of you have been told, you've been taught that if God actually decides to come into your world, he's going to do it small. Don't ask much. Jesus comes big. And he comes generously. And when he reveals who he actually is, he reveals who he actually is. And we're supposed to learn from that. See, every single miracle in the gospel is a deposit on your life. It is a taster. It is a, it, it is a, it is a sign. It's a signal. It's a visual for you to understand that heaven is this exponentially better. I'm getting too excited. I'm going to settle down. Why does Jesus ask the servants to obey him first? This is, this is big. Because he does that. So Jesus could have come and he could have, let's be real, he could have looked at the six stone water jars and he could have zapped them. Wine, and you get wine, and you get wine. Right? He could have just done that. Done. Easy. Easy. Why make servants go all the way down the hill to the, to the, you know, wherever the water is? Well, well thank you. Words, <laughs> words today. 180 gallons had to be carried back. Why? If you were a servant, wouldn't you have asked the question? I mean, once you saw where this was all headed, dude, if you're powerful enough to do that, why'd you make me carry it all? Why start with a step of obedience before the miracle happens. Because let's boil this all down. In your life, you pray for stuff, do you not? In your life, you pray for stuff and you ask God for stuff. And some of you guys have faithfully prayed for big miracles over and over throughout the years. And sometimes God has come in and he's asked you to do a thing before he does a thing, just like the servants did. Why does he do that? First off, I think we can make the wrong, draw the wrong conclusion that God needs you to do something first. He doesn't. God never needs you to do a thing before he can do a thing. There's a lot of times he asks them to partner with him, but it's not because he needs it. I, I, I'll give you a proof on that. You remember when Lazarus is, is raised from the dead by Jesus and he says, roll the stone away. You could conclude that the people had to roll the stone away because of all the miracles Jesus could do, stone rolling was not part of it. He didn't have that power. Except that when Jesus dies and is risen from the dead, three days later, it says there's an earthquake and the stone is moved. So did Jesus have the power to move a stone? Yes. So why did he ask Lazarus people to move the stone? to invite them into the miracle. That's why. And there's reasons. Don't think he has to. He does because he loves you. He invites you in because he loves you. The other thing, and, this, and we can get stuck with this, is, is sometimes we think that the, the action Jesus gives us to take is a test for us. And if we don't pass the test, he won't do the miracle. And do you know what that is? That's law. That's Jesus asked me to do a thing because he needs me to step up and earn this miracle just a little bit. And some of you, the way it shows is every single time you pray, all you hear from, from God, from that voice in your head, all you hear back is you're not good enough. You've not earned this. There's more that you should have done. There's more that you should have done. And that's why everything's broken because you're broken. 
And you're not getting this miracle because you're not good enough for it. And you hear that voice over and over again, ad nauseum into your soul, and it's wrong. Jesus did not come to bring law and death and judgment to you. He came to bring generosity and life and grace to you. It is not lost on me that when Moses, who was the bringer of the law, came to water, he turned it to blood, which was death. And when Jesus came to water and he touched it, it turned to wine. And it was life. There's deeper statements going on in this passage. He does not need you and he is not judging you. So why does God ask us to obey first? First, because he won't enable our bad choices. And sometimes we're stuck in a place and if he gives us the blessing, he knows it will enable us. I recently dropped my daughter off to uh, uh, Georgia at college. <laughs> She's 16 hours away from me and it's awful. Anyway, um, she called me last week and she's just been there for a few weeks. They just got started. And where this college is, it's a bunch of different um, university buildings, and it's across a city, and there's, they've got their own bus system that takes them from the dorm to the class. And wouldn't you know it, some of the freshmen show up to the bus stop a little bit late. Wouldn't you know it? And she was letting me know. She's like, you know, she's like, I actually heard that there were some students that weren't getting to class on time, and they called up mom and dad and said, these bus drivers are not doing what they're supposed to do. And then mom and dad turned around and called up the school and got the bus drivers in trouble. And she's like, I'm so ticked because the bus drivers didn't do anything wrong. Because we'd had this whole discussion even before we left about you got to show up probably 20 minutes ahead and, and, and plan for crowds and all this kind of stuff until you really get the hang of this. You have a bunch of people that aren't. And you got bus drivers who get in hot water over it. Here's the thing. They need to show up for class earlier. And that's just true. And they're 18 years old. And they need to learn that. Because if they don't learn that, their development is going to be stunted. And they're never going to come into full adulthood. And when mom and dad made the call that they made for them... What did mom and dad do? Mom and dad brought a blessing at the wrong moment in the wrong context. Mom and dad brought a blessing, and that blessing became an enablement of bad behavior and destructive behavior. And the Lord of glory will not come and bring a blessing to you that enables your destructive character. He won't do it. He loves you too much. And there are so many times when we pray for something from God and it's the wrong moment to it because we're not ready for it. Sometimes we go and we say, God, help me with my debt and multiply my money, God, my, my accounts. And we're going to the casino every week. If you're struggling with debt and you're going to the casino every week, I don't know that God in his love for you could answer that prayer for you. Because if he did, and he miraculously brought more money into your life, would not that confirm your bad behavior? It would. And you'd walk out of that whole scenario saying, God is so good and I love the casino. And I know people can have fun at a casino, but a lot of us can't. And it's not just there. It's, it's, it's with your kids. Go to God and say, my kids don't respect me, God. God, would you make them respect me? And God's looking at us and saying, yeah, but the step I've got for you here is that you're going to build a bridge to your child. And the step I've got for you, if you will... The jar I want you to fill, where you're going to start, is that you're going to forgive your children, and you're going to stop manipulating them, and you're going to stop acting cruelly to them when they don't get the grade on the report card that you wish they would have gotten. And when you begin to behave differently toward your children, then I'll bring restoration. Not because you've earned the restoration or that you've earned the miracle. Don't get confused like that. It's not about law. 
And it's about, not about God needing you to roll the stone away either. It's your heart has to come to a place where his blessing will not entrench you where you already are. <sighs> Got quiet in here. Love grows as it blesses. I know I spent a long time on that first one. Love grows as it, as it blesses. I love how God, he wants to bless us, but he wants the blessing to bring growth in us. And so he'll shape the blessing in a particular way to cause us to grow. I think about my marriage and, and sometimes, you know, I might be tempted to go to God and say, God, there's bitterness over here and we feel it and there's brokenness that's here. And, and God may come to me and say, the water jars for you today, Josh, are I want you to forgive first. And I want you to do dates. And I want you to do flowers. And Josh, I want you to speak words of affirmation to her. But God, that might not bring it all back together. It's, it's true, it might not. But that's where I want you to be. And then I'll bring the blessing I choose is right for you. But here's the deal, guys. When we go to God and we pray for things, do we pray through this understanding? Do we pray to him and say, God, I do have brokenness and God, I do want you to fix it, but God, start with me. And God, I open up my heart to you. You tell me what water jars to fill. I'll do that. I'll do whatever you want me to do because I'm trying to earn my way to heaven. Heck no, that's not what you're trying to do. That's never what it's about. I, if, if you are in Christ and you know Jesus Christ, you're headed to heaven, praise God. And nothing that you choose to do or not do will impact that. But you could have a miserable journey on the way to heaven. And God wants joy for you, and he wants peace for you, and he wants family for you. He wants restoration for you. He wants all these good things. And he holds out his commands and says, will, will you come and do these things? Because it's going to heal you. Love invites us in. We had a marriage class last week. And the marriage class got too full. There's way too many people in it. Do you know we had four adult leaders came forward and said, we'll teach this marriage class as two different groups of people so that you can split them up so that the couples can actually talk in that marriage class. Isn't that a beautiful thing? Yeah. And we were able to take one class and split it into two. But guess, guess who is going to get the greatest blessing out of this marriage class? The four leaders. And you all know it because they're going to learn the material. They've taken this big step forward with God. They're going to go deeper into it. They're just like the servants in the story. They're the ones who are going to get a front row seat to everything that God's doing. Every time God asks you to obey and to take a risk, he's inviting you into something wonderful. And then last thing, love takes us to where the blessing is. And a lot of times we're not where the blessing is, and we got to move. C.S. Lewis said this, said, God almost always gives us a step to take toward him. God cannot give us a happiness and a peace that is apart from himself because it is not there. There is no such thing. If I could just talk about spirituality like it's geography for a second, some of us are in a place where God is not. We have, we have found ourselves in a place that is about us. And many times what God asks us to do, the jars he asks us to fill, are a way for us to step out of that spot and to step toward him because that's where the peace and the joy is. It's with him. I'll give you an example of that. Several years ago, someone came to me at church. We were still in Illinois. His name's Ron Glick. And he came to me and he said, Pastor Josh, I've decided because I've got this camp that's in, in California and in Northern California, and it's so, so good. He said, I've decided to pay the way for you to take Jacob there, thousands of dollars. And he said, and I'm also going to pay for the flights to get you from Illinois to Northern California, thousands of dollars and back. So I'm also going to pay for the rental car so that you can drive it around for the week and a half that you're there at this camp, thousands of dollars. He says, I'm going to pay for all of that for you to go. My answer to him is I'm too busy. I just got too much going on. If you could see my calendar, we got projects coming up. I can't do it. 
and I don't know if it was Linda that got through to me and knocked me upside the head or what. Somebody did. And I finally decided to go ahead and take Jake to this camp. And I'm making it sound like it was hard for me. It was free. And I remember taking Jake to this camp. We had a good, good time, of course. But they asked for us all to shut off our phones. And we're in this beautiful area, surrounded by nature, surrounded by beauty, surrounded by majesty. But more than anything else, we are surrounded by silence. And if you don't know the power of silence in your life, you need to discover that because it's big. And God needed to pull me to a different place. And my obedience was to go where God was. And when I was there and I was at that camp, I started to hear God in a way I'd never heard him before. I started to speak. And I started to hear some things about my son that I'd never understood about my son before. Because I'm in the grind with him as a parent, you know, every single day, why don't you clean your room? Why are you late? All the stuff, right? And all that stuff just kind of, it kind of colors, it kind of, it kind of just, it flavors everything. And there's so much that you miss when all of that intensity is flavoring everything. And God's like, I need to bring you away from all that into a different spot. And I started to hear some things about my son. And my son started to hear some things about me. And God took our two hearts and just brought us together again. And it was an amazing thing, but it couldn't have happened in Illinois. God had to take us somewhere. And I had to obey and not see myself as so busy that I couldn't do the thing. Making sense today? Would you guys stand? Did you enjoy that first miracle? God's good, amen? Amen. Jesus is worth our worship, but he's also worth our love. He's amazing. I want to pray for you. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you, God, for... Thank you, God, for turning water into wine like you did. And thank you for doing it the way that you did. Thank you for your abundance. Thank you that you're so amazingly generous, God. And we just admit to you that sometimes we come to you with low expectations. Help us to stop that. Help us to imagine big from you. Walk in faith. Walk in generosity ourselves. Lord, also make us ready for whatever steps of obedience you've got in our lives, Lord. Not so we can earn anything with you, not because you can't do it without it, but because you love us. And I pray that we would go to you with an open heart. And I've read the prayer requests, Lord, and I know so many families across our congregation have been dealing with real stuff right now. Real stuff. And it's dominating their attention, dominating their emotions and time. And God, because of that, they've been praying to you already, even before they came in here today, even before they started watching online, Lord, they started, they've been praying. They've been asking you to move. And God, for a lot of them, though, they haven't stopped and just said, Lord, what, what's, what jar am I supposed to fill? Do you have something for me, God? God, and I pray you'd change our prayer life. And I pray that you would speak when we ask you. And I pray, Lord, that you would break through and do so many miracles amongst us. We love you, Lord. In Christ's name, amen.